Yeah, very warm welcome from Art Future for this uh, panel. Um, we are presenting um, this uh, panel with uh, Urban Nights uh, today, and um, I just would like to give you a little introduction. Um, a few days ago, um, I, I saw a study uh, by IBM from the States um, dealing uh, with a platform, something like a Twitter or Facebook, uh, for the state to communicate with the citizens, with the people. It was talking about co-creation, uh, things like that, but basically it was a tool um, for the state to, to do public services uh, with the people. And, um, well, I was asking myself, well, we have Transmediale and uh, Urban Nights, and perhaps um, it's, it's a good time to, to think about alternatives, uh, not done by big business, uh, done by people. Um, and um, yeah, so I would like to um, start and to hand over um, to, to start the, the panel. Thanks uh, for that introduction. Um, so I'm, my name is Teresa Dillon. Uh, I'm the curator for Urban Nights. I'm just going to give a short uh, introduction and an overview of how the panel will actually work and give you some uh, background to where Urban Nights developed. So Urban Nights started last year and it came out of a body of work that has been developing in Dublin for the last three years, namely in a relationship with Dublin City Council and in the Science Gallery. And it grew out really in a way of an exhibition that I was curating called Hack the City in 2012. And sort of from that and the relationship with Dublin City Council, we realized that there was a lot of work taking place in Dublin where people didn't necessarily realize what types of interventions were happening at a city level. So for example, there could be somebody that was doing a community garden who may not actually realize then that there was somebody who was already developing an aquaponic system or various other types of farming techniques within the city. So the core goal uh, for Urban Nights then was to actually create a platform where people who are doing practical interventions, not academic or speculative or hypothetical, could actually come together and have a conversation about the work they were doing and present it. So that's basically Urban Nights and um, I now run it as a, an independent platform and it's taking place both in Dublin and in Berlin at the moment. And this particular session today is uh, one of four that will happen in Berlin um, going forward into April and it's a special edition then within Transmediale. The other important element to, um, I guess, note in terms of the partnership with um, Urban Nights is that, that this uh, was in partnership also with Visa 7, and in particular the studio Visa 7, in particular with Daniel Vasilev, who unfortunately um, is ill today, so can't join us, but Daniel would have been here. And for the last three days, we have been running the other net workshop. Uh, Daniel has also been part of the, the RTAC exhibition as well. But the other net uh, workshop was looking specifically at how you could actually serve from home yourself and looking at a variety of uh, technical platforms that would allow you to almost um, disconnect from the, the mainframe, so to speak. And I think this uh, aspect, when we talk about uh, independent systems for living, I just wanted to characterize really what uh, I define in terms of this uh, concept. So, not being sucking from the main frame would be kind of one of the characteristics. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you're taking electricity, you're often taking it off the main grid. But if you decide then to set up your own uh, electricity system, you're kind of developing something then that provides for yourself. So it's about resource use. And the second thing is when you start to look at this resource use, there's often characteristics then that define the type of people or the type of communities that go towards this independent way. And the value system might be an attitude or an aesthetic. It might be because you want to be self-sufficient, you want to be in control. And so in a sense, it's kind of like looking at what those kind of might be in relation to the actual um, system of the, that, that you're trying to produce independently. And I think the third point in terms of uh, the characteristics for somebody who is maybe active in this particular area also is a question that maybe is also relating a lot to some of the other panel discussions here about user visibility. And I'd like to kind of like keep that in mind as we have the panel conversation, that when actually you make the visible, the user more visible within the system, when you take control of actually what resources that you're using and your effect within the system, then actually this creates a kind of a trigger chain effect. So some of these points we will be discussing uh, collectively, and the reason for bringing this uh, quite generous uh, speakers uh, together really are that 
each one, uh, Jaramel, Jürgen Neumann and Imer Coleman, are working on developing types of independent systems for and related to city living, but living in general. And so each one of us will present for about 10 minutes on the practicalities of the work that we have been doing. And then we will go and have a quick panel kind of conversation that I will be taking notes with and just moderate that. And then we're going to, um, well, our, our, co our core intention is to have a discussion also with you. So we're leaving enough time at the end to actually have that discussion. So um, I guess without any further delay, I'm going to pass over to, to Jaramel and he will lead with a Sweet introduction. Solomon Burke. Praise the Lord. I think um, I was wondering about what could be my contribution to this discussion, and I, I tried to just um, put on the table some, some, some things, some experiences, starting from the experience of coming here in, um, in Berlin. I came by train from Amsterdam, where I live, um, I love trains, actually. It was a pretty good train ride. The Deutsche Bahn has also electricity. Six hours, I just like compute away. In my wagon, there were, uh, we were like three brown people, let's say. And uh, on Bad Ben time, when we passed the border, cops stepped in, uh, German cops in this case, and um, asked directly the three brown people in the, in the, in the, in the, full, in the world wagon uh, for uh, papers. Actually, they asked the first two. I was the third. The, um, the woman that was sitting, a very young, beautiful African woman that was sitting in front of me, was asked to leave the train because she didn't have papers. They looked into her pores and she missed that piece of paper that actually they looked for in order to allow her entrance to Germany. I guess it wasn't a good uh, experience for her. Um, she looked quite relaxed, but um, actually maybe it's, it's useful because maybe she was into some, some human trafficking thing and they just saved her from some weird trip that she was sent to, or she will just have like a very uh, sad um, experience that will make her insecure in, uh, in the future about herself and her place in Europe. But the fact is that um, when I took this picture, then the cop came to me and say, like, why you're taking the picture of this? And I say, like, I'm a journalist. I made it up. I'm not a journalist. But, you know, I could have journalist friends signing up for me for that. And, um, and of course, I mean, he, he couldn't reply to that. And, and then I posed him a question. I asked him, why uh, did you ask uh, directly only the people that look foreigner to you into this uh, train? And the answer, I think, is very interesting. The answer is we cannot ask everyone papers. So there must be a code, a law, that says that you cannot just control everyone in the train and ask everyone a document. So they choose, they pick by prejudice or stereotype, whatever, but they cannot do that. Now I think this answer is very interesting because we are doing exactly the opposite uh, nowadays with surveillance systems with our cities. We are processing data in bulk. Now, connecting to the discussion that in the hacker community we have pretty much about surveillance, I think I would like to push it a bit further in the analysis because I feel a little bit bored of reiterating issues about being monitored. You know, we, we kind of knew we were monitored. There are some people that are struggling to actually get out of the system. There are people living in Wagenplatz here in Berlin just because they don't want to be part of that capitalist system, of that surveillance system. And um, it is not news to them that we are being surveilled. But there is something new that is happening today. And we must be aware of it. 
This is a picture that some people here could, might recognize. It's the picture of uh, Jean Charles de Menezes, the Brazilian citizen that was shot in the tube of London in 2005. By mistake, he was innocent. Exchanged by um, terrorists that they were looking for. His image was basically used after his death as collected from the surveillance system and basically his memory, the memory of him after that, violated this way. What happened there is that the data of the cameras that are watching over the tube system in London, at that time it was a very uh, unfortunate time, of course there were bombing attacks in London in 2005, was trying to process every face and recognize the people moving through the system. So the data was processed in bulk. And this bulk process of data actually led to a false positive, to an error. Now what I'm trying to say with this is that the way law enforcement worked before computationalism, before the age of informationalism, was very different. And for a reason, for an ethical reason. We weren't processing bulk data, analyzing for deviance, putting it into a machine and then operating on this, like we are doing now, which might lead to a certain deafening feeling, even for the law enforcement itself. This is a formula that uh, mathematicians are familiar with. It's, um, it's actually a formula about um, statistics. And it says that when you raise the sample quantity, you also raise the possibility for an error. Now, in statistics, an error can be represented as 0 0.0001. But when an error occurs, it becomes 1. In the case of Jean-Charles de Menezes, it becomes a person life. I'm not sure we can afford that error. I'm not sure we can look with uh, tranquility to that possibility. So what is happening now is that we are building systems that are totally pervasive, processing data in bulk, and sooner or later will always happen that there will be a deviance. My question is, are people really able to opt out from this? Was the Menezes able to write somewhere, I don't want my image to be used after my death? the image that is on every camera and is taped of myself living my life after my life is over. I don't want it to be used. I don't want this to be the memory that is left of me after you kill me as an innocent. <clears throat> Another thing that I like to put on the table is a project I've been involved in the last three years, following the community mostly. It's this, it's very televised, it's very famous and and actually, it's, uh, uh, the way it's going is quite predictable. But it's interesting because it's also about a group of people that wanted to actually self-determine themselves, make business out of a system that exists. They made plenty of errors. Actually, they started trading with existing systems, which is a pretty stupid thing to do if you really want to be pure. Uh, every time you look into an abyss, the abyss looks into you. Friedrich Nietzsche. But what we are left at is um, a lot of imagination of how actually people can build different systems of values and actually represent what they like in them. And it, that is pretty interesting for a network of people that actually try to opt out. They have also like this talk about anonymity, which is like also inflated. Bitcoin is not anonymous. Actually, it's pretty different from that. And... Um, I think that's it. I mean, I would leave it up to discussion. I'm just throwing things on the table. This is intentionally pretty unstructured, so. I kind of realized that the moderator I didn't actually formally introduce each person, so uh, Jorgen, if you can maybe uh, say something of your, your background for those
Yeah, my name is Jürgen Neumann, and I'm one of the co-founders of Freifunknet, which is a community-driven approach to set up, uh, to build our own technical infrastructure in terms of uh, data networks, mostly based on Wi-Fi. And you should see a map now, please. Hello? Can you switch to the other? Fine. Yeah, so um, once you see the map, <clears throat> you will see a representation of a physical infrastructure which is built by people. And uh, when we started this more than a decade ago, we had a problem, we faced a problem. The problem was that the idea of uh, transporting information had become unequal in terms of consumer and uh, people who are offering content, client-server paradigm, whatever, like an unequalness in how people communicate with each other, shape bandwidth, like or asymmetric bandwidth, that if you get data from the internet, you have a higher bandwidth than if you want to send data. And uh, also within the Wi-Fi devices, there was a difference built into the device, which is like different modes that an access point can actually act like. So one is infrastructure mode, which means that this access point is like the central point. The other one would be client mode, which would be something that connects to the access point, which is an infrastructure mode. And there's also a peer-to-peer -peer mode, but it's hardly used. It's also called ad hoc mode. And even though it was part of the standard of Wi-Fi technology, we faced that it wasn't really well implemented into the devices because actually every Wi-Fi device should have an ad hoc mode so that every Wi-Fi device could connect to the other Wi-Fi device, just equal. But when we were starting to build this uh, community Wi-Fi network, we, we were in a situation that ad hoc mode wasn't really well developed. And so we were actually facing a problem that if I was in infrastructure mode and I wanted to connect with him, he had to be in client mode and then, for example, if she wanted to connect with me, it would be okay because she could also connect to me because I'm in infrastructure mode. But then if the two of them would want to connect, they just couldn't because um, they were both in client mode. And so some of them, someone of them would have to set up another node in infrastructure mode. <laughs> and this might sound a bit abstract, but actually what we realized was that it was totally against our vision of how we wanted to form the network because it should be an equal network amongst people in the neighborhood. So we had to find out which technical devices were actually supporting a true ad hoc mode and also we had to write our own protocols to manage that we have a network routing protocol that would take into account that we are equal partners and that we want to build a distributed infrastructure rather than a centralized or decentralized one. And ever since we have been developing this technology on and on and now it's out there and for many years you can consider it very stable but it's not in your cell phones, it's not in your Wi-Fi routers at home and it's not anywhere unless in some uh, parts of the world where some idealists are building an infrastructure like this. And this map is from 2007 and every dot you see is a person that is running an access point at home and every line you see is a connection between the two access points. And altogether it forms an intranet and the purpose of the intranet has always been regarded as to connect the people to the internet. That was like when we started, the aim was to get access to the internet and because there was hardly any DSL uh, available, people were wanting to connect to the internet. Over time, the meaning of this network has changed completely. And since the um, NSA surveillance scandals and Edward Snowden's uh, <laughs> fight or great thing of uh, delivering all this information to us, people are now projecting a different picture into the same infrastructure because now they are thinking of it as an independent network which the people who were originally initiating it also had in mind from the very beginning, but no one did, nobody really understood the purpose. And um, 
The other thing is that the whole idea of a mesh network comes from the military actually because they wanted to have independent communication infrastructure in the field where if a single point of failure was killed, for example, uh, the network should still be operated. And uh, so we took this technology from the military <laughs> and f in first hand we were using it uh, to set up an infrastructure with the purpose to access the internet. And now the purpose has changed into the idea of getting rid of like state surveillance and run your own independent infrastructure. And I think it's very interesting to observe what people start to think if they, if they see such a network. Because in the beginning, when we started, people were saying, this can't work. There's no central management, there's no hierarchy in it, uh, it's totally failure because if you don't manage a system then it will just fail. And uh, what we see now is that maybe this infrastructure is much more stable than a centralized one, but it's always the reflection between seeing this map or see, having a picture in mind about a distributed or any kind of infrastructure and the political situation and your aims to give it a value or a sense. And one thing that we really didn't manage is to have services inside the internet. And until today, most of the services that we are using, beginning with uh, DNS, like the name server in the internet, but also like all the websites and so on and so forth, they are all still centralized services. And if we really want to shift to a decentralized or more decentralized or distributed infrastructure. It will take a lot of work and rethinking of how we actually want to work together and how we want to build trust into a decentralized or distributed infrastructure. Because usually we are trusting in some, someone who is in a kind of a hierarchy, but if we really want to live as people who are equally share the infrastructure, then the, one of the most important questions is like how do we build pr equal trust within a distributed network? That's more or less what I wanted to say as an input to this discussion. Thanks, Jürgen. Um, so I'm Imer Coleman and um, my background is largely in open data. Uh, I've been working, and, and technology I guess, and I've been working up until last March, was working in government for the previous uh, 13 years, um, at local government level, at, at city hall level, and laterally in uh, Whitehall in cabinet office. So I'm going to talk um, really about, about three areas that I'm interested in uh, around cities and, and data particularly, and I'm going to use the London data store um, as, an, as a kind of a, a prism to, to look at that through. And the data store was basically a project initiated by uh, the Mayor of London uh, who wanted to open up all of London's public sector data. And there were two, two or three drivers for that desire, really. One was accountability and transparency. As we know, there's decreasing trust in institutions and governments over the last decade, longer. Um, and, and the push to transparency was, was a way to sort of improve that. But equally, there was a belief that if we released public sector data sets, we could create some economic stimulus because we would have technologists, software developers, etc., building products and services. <clears throat> so in policy context in a city, that seems like a pretty linear thing. So the mayor, who's the uh, elected representative of the people, makes the decision and decides that he wants to do this, and his public officials are supposed to do that, right? Sorry. Um, so, so, so that seems like a linear proposition. Uh, the elected mayor wants to do something, the officials are to carry it out. But that's not actually how it happens in a bureaucracy, uh, because this, the bureaucracy is very resistant to doing that. So officials in the various organizations in City Hall basically did not want to do this. And so we had to, I had to find a mechanism for how we might do this. And this is the model that I came up with. So basically, I was the state internally as a public official. Um, so I was representing the state in City Hall. Uh, and civil society was, society was represented by a group of technologists that had come on board from the very early stage. So when we decided to create the data store, we did an open call to London and said, we want to release London's data, come and help us. And 60 technologists turned up on a Saturday morning, which is pretty rare for hackers uh, to get up that early, um, and basically gave, told us what they wanted us to concentrate on in terms of releasing data, 
uh, and that we should not worry about formats and get into arguments about linked data, but simply release it as long as it wasn't in PDF. And out of those 60, there was a group of 10 who basically then formed around me a kind of a, a collaborative group who were outside City Hall. So we worked in tandem together and in collaboration. So there were times, I, there were things I could not say publicly as an official, but they could because they're networked and vocal uh, and, and tech savvy. So when I couldn't say things publicly, they'd blog about them. And then I'd point that blog to Charles Arthur, who's uh, the tech editor in the Guardian newspaper, who was very pro open data. And then he'd write something in the Guardian. And then I'd be able to go to the eighth floor and say to the mayor, yeah, you need to do something about this. So it was, it was the state working with civil society to disrupt the state. Okay? And so that's quite a non-linear a non model. Um, over time, uh, we then asked that the 10 technologists who had been working with us would, be, would form an advisory board for the mayor, the mayoral, mayoral advisory board. Um, and so these were not your normal kind of board members for the smart city kind of approach where you'll have IBM and Cisco and all the large systems integrators, but these were individual technologists who, you know, were, were very bright and very savvy and could provide good kind of critical friends. And although London now has a smart London board, it kind of reflects the origins of that. So there's, they're largely academics um, and individuals rather than um, the sort of usual smart city. So um, going back to exactly what Jurgen's saying in terms of, um, uh, you know, who owns this smart city space? Um, and it's really, I guess, what I would think the replaying of this famous kind of, you know, Jane Jacobs versus Robert Moses, except this time with tech. So the people who are all over local government in the UK, and I'm sure here, are the IBMs and the Cisco's. Uh, and the state is very interested in local government, it's very interested in using its data, but it's all about the instrumental reach of the state and what we want to do, what they want to do, and how they want to change our behavior, right? You know, there are arguments about it's good value for money, we can, you know, we can decrease the cost of public service delivery when we have better understanding. And, and some of that is true. But cities are not places, you know, this concept of city as a platform, you know, as if, right, you know, cities are messy and complex and have legacy systems. You know, London's underground is, is you know, over 150 years old. So for example, you know, there are things you just cannot do there. So things have to be done by mesh. And just like you say, in terms of your network, you know, you can't build a solid platform. That's what people like Cisco want, put in the kit and own it. But we know that owning the kit isn't just about the kit, okay? So, that, so there are, are issues there. Um, and I'm just going to finish with a, an example of, I'm, I now uh, I'm part of a startup in London called Transport API. Um, and we, we operate a data as a service on public transport. So if you're a developer, you can build apps on, on our uh, Transport API. But we're also developing this, which is called Transport Buzz. Um, and this basically mines geolocated tweets uh, for anything to do with public transport. And you can see them, somebody there is complaining about, um, because they're having motion sickness on the bus, there's somebody eating a Big Mac next to them and they're going, the hashtag must have bad karma. Um, so, so the concept here is how do we look at what is self-published on, published on a public timeline that we might be able to feed back to transport authorities to say, you know, these are the things that commuters are concerned about. Maybe you might think of addressing these because if we want more sustainable uh, transport, then we want to encourage more people to use public transport and less cars. But there are reasons, there are barriers why people don't want to use public transport. And sometimes the behavior of other commuters is part of that. Um, and so we have interest from transport operators who are saying, can we take a look at these feeds in real time? But equally, so we need to you know, co-produce uh, solutions around you know, delays, traffic, lateness, all of these things. So we have local media companies interested in looking at our products, so if somebody's saying something in real time in the city or saying, hey, there's a problem here, they can connect directly with the citizen commuter uh, and provide more real time information. So I think this is a, uh, an interesting because it is self published and we're trying to use that to improve, uh, to improve the commuting life uh, for citizens in London and across the UK. like a dream, a dream panel that actually all stop even before I have to wave any signals of time. So um, what I'm going to do now is just to kind of uh, condense really in a way and just uh, throw a few questions to the panel. We almost have an hour left, so there's actually quite a lot of time for um, engagement and questions from, from the floor as well. Um, 
So we had sort of a set of questions that were informing our discussions prior, prior to meeting today around the, the design of a system, the design of a network, user, user visibility within that, the relationship of the user, what are the value systems um, underlining it. And uh, there's just a few kind of key things that I thought were interesting from what the, the, the speakers um, referred to. And Jaramel said, you know, what happens when we can't opt out? So I guess one thing that I thought about was like, where is the room for hope <laughs> if you <laughs> can't opt out? And uh, Jürgen then also was uh, referring to the, the meaning of, uh, that's behind the meaning of the network and the, how the users uh, and the people involved with the community actually uh, could disrupt uh, the original intentions. So you design something for equality, you design something for trust, and then as time evolves and the system becomes maybe more uh, hardened, then corruption starts perhaps within something that was originally intended to, to be more uh, equal. So this is also something that I'd like maybe the, the, the panel to kind of comment on. And Emer then also flagged this, this question of, of trust as well. And one of the phrases that actually I first heard Emer say was about change agency and how does a change agency work at this governance level where she actually was speaking really about um, ma manipulation, I think, in, in some respect, where you had to play some smart moves to turn a government on to something that they didn't want to in the first place. And uh, so I guess my other kind of reflection really was on the role of manipulation and m manipulation then that leads to maybe the changes, but it can also lead to the corruptions and, and this uh, break of, of trust. Um, and this role of, of, of hope, if there is a feeling that in the afterglow there may not be any hope, and what uh, actually psychologically this has as an effect um, on the individuals and on collectives. Um, and I kind of would like the, the panel to comment on that, and then we will take it out. Yeah? I think uh, we have to see it from a different perspective, because there will be never a, a pure solution it. I would argue there is no purity per se from a, in, a, in a philosophical sense and I say that because I think the solution is provided by the best mm, people that have formulated uh, um, this argument against purity. Um, Antonio Caronia who disappeared uh, earlier this year uh, is, is the Italian writer that most translated most of Donna Haraway, for instance, or, or Catherine Hiles. And this, this current of, of post-human uh, uh, philosophy describes it pretty well, the way you, have, you need to have a transversal approach to the systems in which we are, because I doubt there is a way out by now. And we do apply computationalism and informationalist approaches uh, to a large extent to most of our systems, and we reach abstractions that we cannot even control from, uh, from uh, the flash crash on. Um, we are running these systems, uh, uh, we are using them now to fly uh, uh, things in the air that carry uh, explosives. And <laughs> and hopefully this will bring democracy in all the world. So <laughs> this, this is, of course, something that we can't even stop. There is a meter industrial complex that we can maybe tame down to certain ethical points. But um, I think seeking a, a hope, a way out of the tunnel is, is pretty naive. It's as naive as thinking that, uh, uh, yeah, Oh Lord, he is good, mm -hmm. and I don't care if he, if he sees me everywhere, because you can run, you can't hide, but he loves me, and I love him. I mean, there is no, 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 no total solution to, the, to these problems. There is awareness, and I think also, uh, I say this uh, for, for a self-criticism, because as a hacker, we are like always. Uh, talking about, oh my God, they're spying on us, and we are like uh, obsessed by this. But at the end, if you look around yourself, we are the 
we are the people that uh, nowadays the NSA and other law enforcement agencies write down as super empowered individuals just you know for for the capacity of communicating that you have and we can't project the fears of this one percent on the rest of the world because out there there are people that actually are pretty happy about giving up their privacy to actually have a place out there to shine the bling in the camera and to have you know hope that out of a series of tweets or a cool Facebook page you will have actually a job into you know showbiz or whatever and um, I mean how far can we go in saying like isolate yourself and find shelter because oh my god everything is bad out there it can't be so simple and we can't uh, um, we can't seek a solution we can just like try to 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 be shifting our points of view and try to really understand what is the most inclusive way to build systems in which you know we can we can that, that we can still call gesellschaft i don't think that going back to this gemeinschaft dream is is the is the actual solution yeah to me i think if we if we if we look at it from what you said and also if we keep in mind that technical infrastructure becomes key to exchange of information and to access to knowledge then i think and at the same time this digital infrastructure is so very abstract i mean why are we drawing maps of to represent the infrastructure because otherwise we can hardly see it or imagine it and the problem is that within every infrastructure you have politics and power structures which is nothing new like when 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 we were discussing like railroad systems or how where which way street should go cities have always struggled like saying we want to have a station the trains should stop at in our town because uh, we want to be connected to the rest of the world we want to participate in the economic system we want our inhabitants being able to travel and so forth and this also happens of course in technical infrastructures but it's somehow invisible and so by the people and the big companies and the states who are building these infrastructures around the world from their perspective of how the system should work they already implement politics into the system and they already implement their vision of this world into the system. And I think if we as a civil society are so disconnected from this technical infrastructure and we can hardly imagine what people are talking about and what its impact actually is, then we are also disconnected from the most important role that we can play in a society, which is defining how this should look like. And, and I think <laughs> that's a, that's the, the, some of the most important things that I have learned for myself from dealing with a funny community Wi-Fi network, which I started 11 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and I, th I think one of the issues as well is that people, people aren't really aware um, as much as they should be about data. I mean, when I worked in government, uh, people used to always say, you know, oh, you know, it's terrible how much data the government has on me, you know, and I used to say, if only, compared to what your mobile phone operator has on you, okay, so, and people just didn't kind of realize, and I remember the CTO of O2 saying to me, you know, I could probably tell you the Indian takeaway that you use every Saturday night, and I said, oh, I do use an Indian takeaway every Saturday night, and he said, yeah, but so do half of the UK, so don't worry about it, but um, I think there is a case for really, you know, we have to decide, you know, what our rights and responsibilities are. What, what am I prepared to exchange for free? Okay, so I'm a Google Mail user. I have been since the start. If I knew now, you know, then what I know now, would I have chosen to have a free service? You know, would I prepare to pray for my privacy? These are questions that many people aren't even asking, right? But it comes down to, you know, I need to have clarity around the choices I'm making. I need to be the one that can say to the state or to the, to the municipality, I'm okay with you using my data because it's going to make a better city for my, my fellow um, citizens. But there are choices I need to be able to make. And I, so I think it has to be privacy by design uh, and then opening up by choice because, because you make that choice as a citizen. And I don't think we have to date have, that, have had that level of maturity in the discussion. 
thank you. I'm not. Uh, how does it work now from the panel? Do I do I move around at this microphone? Or we've got some roaming, right? So I think we can, at this particular point, uh, open us uh, out. Uh, there's one thing I guess that you should be aware. I mean, we have been having conversations now for quite a few weeks. Uh, behind this um, discussion. So some of my own questions were just kind of provoking some of the thoughts that we had and also in particular uh, looking at this role in terms of, I just want to bring it back a bit to the, the kind of psychology, the psychology behind uh, this kind of awareness and uh, responsibility kind of question. There's always, if you look at developmental theories of psychology, there's always a tension between the individual and the system that they're using. And to release that tension, we appropriate or we make, we, we, we bend and we twist what's given to us. And that allows us to create a sense of freedom and, in a sense, uh, um, releases this tension, in a sense, which is a, a relating to this opting out. And it's, it's not necessarily about this naivety that we can't uh, opt out, but it's actually emphasizing that this is a fundamental aspect of uh, human interaction in a sense and how how do we allow for that to happen if there is um, very dominant um, and pervasive or invisible structures that we are now inheriting and this uh, responsibility of being informed I think is actually uh, quite an important point so questions uh, anybody like to start the ball rolling <laughs> <laughs> Better. Okay. Oh, great. Um, regarding what Emmer just said, is it Emmer? Emmer? Emmer. Okay. Sorry. So I think it's an important distinction between thinking about a consumer or a user. You just said that you need to have choices and you need to be involved. And <clears throat> it always bugs me when I see people that use information presented as consumers, where it's, this is like an old paradigm where you use up something like a natural resource and then it's gone, you know? But as an as a information user, I don't consume information. It's not gone afterwards. And maybe you have some thoughts on that, that distinction. Can you just ex extrapolate a bit more? Just like you said um, that you think it's important that one should be able to have choices about how data is being used and all this. And I see this as a larger problem of people that use information being presented as consumers instead of being users, where a consumer is a passive role, I'm being pushed or fed information that's prepared in a certain way for me, and so uh, a certain paradigm is being um, imposed on me by the way this is prepared, whereas a, as a user I go out actively and I choose information that I want to not consume but to make use for myself, you know? No, no, I, I agree. I mean, and that's, that's my, you know, my point about, about Gmail, for example, at the start, where, you know, I'm actually creating data as well every time I'm using that service or as a user, um, and so I need to have control, control over that. And also, I think it's, a, it's important uh, to look at, I mean, Jaron Lanier's point in terms of who owns the future, in terms of what is happening to this content as well that's being created, and any value add that can be given back to the actual creator or user, right? Um, because if you look at something like our Transport Buzz, if we make a commercial product out of that, it's actually built on, you know, the content that individuals have made. And you could have an argument for <coughs> micro-licensing back some of that. So I think those distinctions about user, customer, consumer, citizen are all valid. Maybe you don't have questions. Maybe you just want to comment or say something, whatever you like. <laughs> uh, one question for now. Um, as a uh, university teacher, I'd like to uh, push students towards investigating, uh, exploring, addressing the issues um, the panel have brought up. Um, but I'd like your recommendations or suggestions 
of tools that uh, I could steer students towards, um, particularly perhaps students that are not outright programmers but just you know, dabblers. Or alternatively, um, uh, examples, case studies of uh, nice projects done by um, non-expert programmers kind of that relate to this theme. Well, I can, uh, the technology that we've been implementing into the Wi-Fi routers, for example, allows you to play with these th three different types of infrastructures, like a central, a decentralized, and a distributed one. And it, you can also really, like, <laughs> set it up and see the consequences. And, you, and the, like, you can really, I think you can learn a lot about um, the different designs and what it actually means. And it's not so complicated, but it's still it's still requiring some kind of technical interest. But yeah. Um, just in terms of uh, resources, there are two books I'd recommend for your students. One is a book by Anthony Townsend, which I think is called uh, Smart, um, "Smart Cities and the Civic or, uh, Civic Hackers." Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get, you, get them for you afterwards if you can come up. And the other one is a book published by Code for America last year called "Beyond Transparency." And that has um, largely U.S. experience of, of civic uh, innovation. And I would also encourage everybody to do the Code for an Hour, which is an initiative of the Bill Gates Foundation. And it uses Angry Birds as a mechanism for teaching you how to code. And it's, it's really simple and easy, but it gets the point across really quickly. Well, in general, it's pretty interesting to play with uh, the Twitter API. Uh, and, uh, you know, like it has a, there is a lot of value there, and probably it's there to stay. I mean, uh, Adam Marvitson called it uh, general sentiment, um, the analysis that uh, you can do of data and actually what is the value of it. There is a big value in that. It's uh, used for predictions. The first industry that uh, used um, predicting user behavior uh, was the flight industry because um, they need to fill up planes, so they need to know when to take off, and the plane has to be full. It's not a coincidence that they were also the first one creating complementary currencies. The miles, the air miles, they are um, exactly what a currency can be, a tool to predict desires. Um, uh, Georg Simmel, uh, Philosophies des Geldes, he says at a certain point that we, as humans, became almost indirect beings uh, between money and our desires. And uh, I think that this tendency to predict and to preempt is very prominent in many fields of development today, both in a dangerous or, or, or useful way. Coming back to law enforcement, for instance, most arrests that we hear about uh, terrorists around, they are done preemptively. So we are, um, we are trying to guess if people will commit a criminal act, if they are you know, intending to. It's quite frightening, actually. And it's a, it's a weird logic, but it is uh, heavily present in all kinds of uh, military doctrines since uh, you know the advent of this like preemption of, of avoiding something that is going to happen so the analysis the prediction of the future is the actual field that is a way to so i would say um python although i don't like really a scripting language ruby this kind of new generation languages um, they are not so, they are scripts, they, they, they can pretty well work for what you need to do. I use shell scripts most of the time, kind of old school approach. They are not so difficult and we need to build a little bit of a, a literate approach to, to code. So uh, I, would, I would go for that. And um, there is plenty of, there are plenty of things, I mean, base everything on GNU Linux, I would heavily recommend to stay on GNU Linux. BSD is, is a kind of com compromise the way Apple works. You can still script things in there. 
but uh, the, the real Unix philosophy of uh, piping things, of breaking things in pieces and then eventually combining them, making them interoperable rather than building the tool that is going to solve all your problems, like, rather than building the office suite. We have like many little components can be piped into each other. That is a winning uh, strategy always, to just choose that way because it's resilient. And uh, of course, you don't have all your, all your life uh, for studying. You know what you are, what you're going to learn. You want you want it to be there to be solid enough. So I would recommend uh, looking in things also that uh, uh, lasted long. Uh, I use the same software for my mail setup since uh, ten years, fifteen years. Since the internet came, I still use. It quite the same tools. <laughs> and uh, ProcMail is around since, uh, since uh, for, yeah, people want to substitute it now. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, like I'm quite conservative on these things. And um, yeah, look at, look at things that exist for long and invest on, and, and don't just like buy the, the, the new, uh, you know, uh, redesigned, uh, uh, remarketed thing, go beyond the surface on that. Sometimes the most solid tools are not well marketed. <laughs> just sorry. just <clears throat> to, maybe to add something to this, because we are not, maybe we are falling back into a discussion that uh, you are all bored of. But um, I think uh, the problem is that, as we said earlier, this digital infrastructure and tools are shaping our lives in a way that uh, I think we are only very slowly getting aware of. And so how can we manage to be adult or uh, to be, uh, to be um, emancipated part of decision-making process that is taking place all the time? <clears throat> Sorry. And at the same time, the computer, which is actually a general purpose machine, which can do anything, is, has become a consumer product and it has been formed into something for a purpose, a device that we are using, not as a general purpose machine anymore, but as part of a consumer chain. And uh, so we are, we are also over time, which is only very short, I mean, think about it for the last 30 years only, we are, we are already disconnected from this technology further than we could be in any sense. Like, other people are defining what, what programs run on your system. Other people are defining how software looks. Other people are defining the infrastructure we are using, and so on and so forth. But where is the momentum to, to really get part of the discussion again, to become part of the design force which is defining all this? And I think we actually <laughs> there's no way I could imagine than learning the language that is used to define these systems. And I think that's a very difficult part in this whole discussion. Um, just, uh, I will take that, I'll take your question uh, just to be more specific to Rob's question. Um, own cloud, Jaromel, super glue, hot glue, these are all um, tools that, uh, okay, your students would need some level of technical um, knowledge, but actually it would be good for them to start to look at. And the other next workshop, which uh, Daniel Vasilev was leading, there will be a, a wiki related to that, which could be actually very helpful um, towards this direction of tools that might at least open the mind or the awareness. Um, I just also want to say something uh, just before the question, but uh, I think this question around digital literacy is quite important here uh, in terms of what we're speaking about, because uh, how, how deep do you go into learning the code yourself? And there's arguments at the moment that this uh, literacy can also um, create further divides between rich and poor or also just continue this uh, disruption as well when uh, a literacy skill becomes a dominant skill, like we all have to speak English, for example. And there's pros and cons to this as well, but I just wanted to flag that we're kind of close to that territory. So a uh, question at the back and then, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, talking about the, continuing the topic about that we are all dependent on computers and stuff, uh, as we all know, we are here in this room representing like one part 
like one percent of the world population, whereas like most of the population of the actual world has no connection to technology. And it would be very lucky for all of us on this planet if it wouldn't be required to have that much of technology produced, that much of waste as we see the land fields of computers already accumulating and getting into this. Um, my question would be like, have you seen a project that would successfully involve in media, would successfully be involved in the new technology without contributing to the consumption, without making everyone, every each participant enabled only through obtaining the new technology, only through buying a new gadget, only through owning a budget? Can you recall a project that exists in, in this non-damaging the universe field? Purity, eh? <laughs> Well, uh, I don't want to uh, talk about what I did in the past, but actually I, I just like humbly concentrated on uh, uh, running, uh, on writing things that would run on old computers, on recycled computers, not on new computers, not on... Uh, so I would say there is a range of things that actually they don't really find... It's hard to find a business model, but some are, 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 are resisting and they run on old computers. Developing. Um, I, I did a, an operating system in the past, Dynabolic, published uh, together with other people, of course, like gathering the, the, the enormous collection of software that the GNU project has and, and beyond. And um, one thing I made sure is that it would run in 64 megabytes of RAM back in 2001, and that was an amazing uh, hit because we also could run it on Xbox game consoles. So now, I would, I would add to your, to your remarks the fact that uh, the, um, the most present infrastructure, technological infrastructure in the world is, uh, uh, in terms of personal computing, are game, gaming devices. And um, I would say that any project uh, that wants to achieve that, uh, um, uh, that good uh, ethical goal uh, should uh, stress uh, game uh, device producers to actually open up the access to their devices, because by implementing uh, uh, digital restriction management, uh, they are basically closing off the possibility of people to uh, run software and to access technology, to access the internet through an existing uh, technological device. I was once walking through a jungle in Indonesia, and there was absolutely no infrastructure but I start, suddenly I started watching through the jungle, I was reaching the kampung, and I started the, watching a cable running through the, and I was like really wondering, what is this cable for? So I followed it, and I reached this hut, and inside the hut there were four or five kids sitting playing with Playstations. <laughs> and that was the only <laughs> electricity infrastructure they, <laughs> they needed. And actually it could be, it could also function as a, telephone, uh, uh, as a, as a uh, they call it uh, uh, Vartel, um, as a telephone boot, uh, as an as a internet boot, uh, Varnet. Um, there is a very interesting study also like on, on how the internet was actually relevant, access to the internet was relevant to actually get out of the dictatorship in Indonesia. Uh, Merlina Lim is the, the author of this. And actually, I'm mentioning this because I would like to, to see that further. I, I'm not mentioning projects specifically because there are many out there. And I would say the GNU project in general, it's, uh, it's the, the biggest effort to do this. Um, and also the, the focus that the Linux kernel has in running on all devices. And there are business models out of that. XBMC, for instance, is one of the best media centers that you can run to actually build your own TV that is not locked in, and it ran back then on a, on a Xbox game console, so it was optimized for, for old computers as well, and now we can run it on Android devices, because they are new devices, but they are like old computers in a way, so you don't require so much resources. So I would say uh, we have to keep an eye on the computational resources that we are demanding, and most um, uh, companies that are like the oligopoly of operating systems, Apple, Microsoft, they are just like capitalizing on the fact they require more. They are constantly requiring more uh, resources to actually run. That is quite unethical as a behavior, but it's of course business as usual. 
Yeah, I just, I, I'm really interested in the work um, of uh, an academic who works in Newcastle called Dr. Sugata Mitra, who has a project called The Hole in the Wall. I don't know if you're familiar with it. And so he takes what are essentially really, really old, clapped out computers that just about work and puts them in very remote villages uh, in India, um, often where n nobody speaks English. And he, he builds a wall and he puts the computer into it and he builds a small roof so only the children of a certain size can actually get access to this. And it's absolutely fascinating. It's a really low technology approach. And he leaves some, uh, he, he, he puts some documents in English in it. Um, and it's amazing watching the children. So you'll see the first child go up and look at this thing and think, what does it do? And press the button and something happens. And they're like, oh my god. And then they bring other kids to, to look at it. And gradually, they work together with children of different ages, figuring out different bits of how it works. And it's fascinating. You, you, if you Google it, you, you'll find it on YouTube. But they, when they visited six months later, they said to the children, what do you think? And they said, uh, we need a faster CPU and a better mouse. <laughs> okay? So they figured this out completely themselves just by working together. Now, in the UK, they tried to replicate a similar thing because they thought it was about technology. Okay? So they got every child a laptop. Right? But that didn't really work because the point was not having everybody having a laptop. It was the children working together to figure out the problem. So it was understanding the role of collaboration and peer-to-peer -peer learning because, because Sugata Mitra's academic research was about uh, coming out of analysis they'd done about the quality of teachers in Indian schools. In other words, the qualifications started to go down the further away from the larger cities you went. So the quality of teaching was degrading the further out. And so what he was really looking at was the power of self-learning. So it wasn't really about technology. It was about how, how these children were helping each other to learn. Uh, and it wasn't about every kid having a laptop. Yeah, <clears throat> my, my comment perfectly fits into what you were just saying. I think if you think about the time of the great industrial success, um, we were living in a world where everybody by observation could understand the technical instruments we were using. And we must understand that the time we are living now is not like this. And with patenting and closing down technologies for proprietary uh, purposes, we don't have the chance to actually learn or observe how the technology works and uh, what it's used for and so on and so forth. And, and this is a great shift in our culture because until now we were always able to somehow find out what was going on and now it's, it becomes more and more difficult and also uh, you get punished if you <laughs> do this, if you are trying to <clears throat> just redistribute knowledge about something that you shouldn't. And that's why I think it's not only about open source, of course, again, in terms of software and stuff like this, but it's also about open technology in general, that the things we are using to build and construct the world that surrounds us and defines us in some ways should be accessible for us and open to understand how it actually works and what it actually does. I think that's very, very important. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Emer actually. Um, so, in some of the work I've done before, I had to m deal with uh, city-level middle management and government, and I think they hold the keys to getting anything through. I mean, the guy sitting at the top can say, "Do this," but they're the people who actually have to do it. And you talked about that challenge a bit, but somehow in the story that you were telling us, middle management disappeared mm -hmm. once the civil society got involved. So I was just curious about. Mm -hmm what that process was, because I'm sure they were still resistant to what your efforts were with the new advisory council and things like that. So just curious about that. Yeah, I, I mean, risk-averse behavior, you know, is not unusual in any bureaucracy. Um, and, and that would be the same in private sector as it is in the public sector. Um, and I think it's, I mean, t um, Tom Steinberg, who's, who is the founder of My Society, I'm sure a lot of you would know My Society. Um, Tom says, oh, said to me when I started out in this, uh, you know, the, the, the way to do this is to find the person who really cares, right? Well, actually what he said was who gives a shit, but I don't know if I'm allowed to curse anyway. But, you know, you find uh, around the organization, not in the places where you think they're supposed to be, right, by title, people who care, right? People who come into the public sector because they really want to make a difference. And if you can create a network of those people, 
you know, you can, you can make change because they will give you things and tell you things. Um, so I had some fantastic colleagues in Transport for London who were giving me information, you know, that I wasn't getting further up. Um, because they, they wanted to help and, and they would say to me, keep pushing our organisation because we want to see this openness but we're being stopped further up. So it's really about how do you find a network of the people who really care. Um, and sometimes calling out public officials as well, you know, I mean, the great thing about the collaboration with technologists was I would have meetings with other public officials and the technologists would say stuff that I couldn't possibly say to a colleague. So one of them at one point said to a very senior official, um, hang on a second, yeah, the mayor wants this, you work for the mayor, what am I missing, right? You know, that's your job, mate, was basically what he was saying. Now, I, you know, it would have been more difficult for me to say that. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's about finding about the people who care and about calling people back to their duty, which is you're there to serve the citizen. You're there to serve the democracy, first of all. You're not there to serve your internal self-serving systems, right? Thank you. Um, my question goes a little bit in a similar direction, but addresses to all of you three. Um, it's a shame that Jeremy just went out, but um, okay, <laughs> sure. Um, anyway, it's kind of hard to to you know get that together in English, but I'm trying to to um, organize my thoughts. All of you thought uh, three uh, talked about society and community, or state and civil, and. Um, I think those are not the same, like society and state are not the same and community and civil are not the same. But my question goes in a, in a direction with, which uh, addresses all of them in terms of, Jarmo said, it's not about, act, well, if I got you right, it's not about acting in a, in a community, it's, it's more acting in a society, about acting in a society. So addressing those, let's say, problems you, to, you, talk, uh, you talked about, uh, it is not only solving those problems within a community, it's more about addressing those problems in a society. So my question goes in the direction like when you as a, you know, uh, let's say um, as a state asking the civil to hacking the bureaucracy of the state, um, how is that functioning? If I, if I would think, you know, Berlin mayor would ask us here to hack the system in Berlin, I don't know if any would come, you know, anybody would come. Because they were asking, like, why should we work with the mayor? It's like, maybe some people would come. I, I wouldn't, I think, because I would think that, uh, is he fooling me? I mean, it's like, why, wh sorry, but why the fuck should I work for him, you know? Uh, this is the one point. Like, as activists, why should we work with the state? Because we are working against the state. Um, I mean, that, that's stupid, but it is like that, right? So the second question is, if we are acting in a society, addressing all those problems or questions, um, how, do we do with, how do we do this without um, always you know, trying to build up communities who are saving us uh, against a repression? So um, what you said about um, making a point or acting against, you know, society problems, how can you do that without doing that in a hacker community or in an activist, whatever community, in a feminist community? However you do your work, how can you do that without um, acting out of a safe space into the society? And what kind of spaces do you need if you don't have that or if you're not trying to do that? Is my question clear? It's all about like the combination between society and community. Okay, well, uh, just, to, just to answer, your, if I understand you correctly, one of, going back to that model of you know, the, the state and civil society equals disrupt the state, okay? I mean, clearly that's a workaround for bureaucracy, you know, for failure in the system, for a dysfunctional system, right? And many bureaucracies are very sclerotic. So that wouldn't, you know, that's an abnormal situation. You expect a bureaucracy to work in a certain way. You know, it doesn't do what it's expected to do, so you have to disrupt it, okay? So that, that was really that model. And, you know, I think what happened in London was we asked before we did anything, we invited uh, the hacking community, you know, the, the activists, the civil activist community into City Hall and said, what, what do you want? What do you want me to do to go after? I will, I, will, I will go into that bureaucracy and fight for you to get this data. What do you want? Right? What are your priorities? So I think we had a, it was a very interesting blog that was written shortly afterwards by one technology who was very respected in that community who said, you know, this is a good start. 
because the state has invited us in. It's been very open, very transparent. So I think you can, you know, transparency is the key because you have to trust me. If you're an activist, you have to trust the official that they will make change, okay? And that trust breaks down. That, you know, that's the end of the initiative. So, so it's all about that absolute openness and transparency. Um, and I remember, I remember when uh, about, a, about a year after I'd worked in the data store, um, the Guardian newspaper ran a small piece about um, some of the assembly members in City Hall were objecting to my appointment as director of digital projects. And it was a political, you know, political game playing. And so they call me the kind of Twitter czar, okay, you know, clearly being disparaging, um, and, then, and then printed my salary. And I thought, oh my God, all these hackers and activists who work, you know, for nothing are going to think that's an enormous salary, right? It didn't name me, but it, 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 you, you could deduce who I was. So I just emailed and, and DM'd them and I said, hey, look, you know, it's me they're talking about. You know, I know you've been working with me for nothing for a year. And, and loads of them came back to me and said, I don't care what you're paid because if we don't have you in there, we're not going to get what we need, right, in terms of transparency. So I was perfectly happy, you know, for that to happen and to have that discussion. So I think it's about absolute transparency. Um, uh, and, and that encourages that kind of collaboration. Um, as an activist, I don't feel like I'm fighting the state, as I also don't feel like I'm, I'm uh, what I'm fighting really in my life, I think I was just wondering what I'm fighting for. <laughs> I, think, I, think I'm, I think I'm fighting reductionism, because I'm, I'm fighting the prejudice that we use to actually identify a person like the case in the train I was. I'm fighting the fact that we are reducing complexity because of our ignorance, and then we make up stereotypes that we apply everywhere. And they, this is a dangerous uh, situation. Reductionism I itself has a very sad uh, story as a, as a term in philosophy here in Germany. It, we should never believe the fact that everyone is like that, all these conspiracy theories going around about the people, they are all trying to reduce complexity to actually make us feel safe that we can blame someone for it. So I think that is what I'm fighting. And I am personally very annoyed by liturgy also. And the state often actually applies a lot of liturgy to actually keep together that power. So that is kind of annoying. I like people that speak like they eat, like we say in Italian. But, uh, yeah, I think that's it, yeah. Mm. <clears throat> I'm trying not to fight at all. <laughs> because <clears throat> if I was fighting all the time, I would behave like a soldier or as, like as somebody who is uh, in this combatant situation all the time. And I don't think that's a good basis for making trust or to to work in the sense that I think is more important than any fight. <laughs> uh, at the same time, I'm an activist, I'm also a business person, I also do talk to politicians and mayors, and I'm doing a lot of things that are very, maybe, like a contradiction to each other or don't make sense if you look at it in, in stereotypes or you think uh, a person that does this shouldn't do that or I don't know what. <laughs> But um, what I, I totally agree, for example, on this, like this pseudo reduction is something very dangerous. If we always try to make things simpler, it must be easy. You know, everything is promising easiness. Like it's so easy, you just to have to do this and that and that, and then ha, ah, wonderful. <laughs> and that's a lie, and we all know it. But uh, somehow we want to believe it because it's also easy to us if it's also easy. But it. Uh, it also creates a distance from reality that is getting bigger and bigger. And I think if we, if we don't want to stick to, well, I mean, reality, okay. Uh, I know that there's not one reality and blah, blah. But you, but you know what I mean. I mean, you, the further you get away from what you can actually observe for yourself, call it your own reality, but from your own observation, the more distance you get from your own observation, then I think this is, there's a danger in it, and I don't like this danger, and in that sense, we are combatants. 
fighting. <laughs> I, I like to put forward a proposal. I just got uh, an idea, and, and it's something like it's a, it's a pet uh, project that I'm starting up. Uh, darf ich de drei uh, video uh, kanale? Thank you. It, it's, um, it's, it's a proposal to actually demilitarize the language around networking. So in networking we have a problem because it comes from military technologies. We use terms like uh, uh, firewall or a shield or you know like uh, a defense system and intrusion detection and penetration testing and it, it's like <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's quite, so what I'm trying, I'm, I'm writing, I started writing something to, to build the masquerading uh, uh, systems for home and office networks. And I called it, I was looking for a name, I called it DAOs. So I, I like to, you know, just propose and put forward, let's look for metaphors to actually describe and, and change our language around networking to demilitarize it, you know, mm -hmm. like setting up a network and finding out the paths for the package for the packets might be just like an activity of dowsing, uh, looking yeah. for, for, for the internet and understanding which paths to do. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, we could, we could look at other terms. And I really, I really hear you when you say like, yeah, I don't want to live like a soldier. Indeed, it is a very important statement because we do live in a, in a, in a, in a reality that is constantly represented to us. Uh, as far away there is war and if, if we don't start envisioning what is peace, we, we will forget it. And so it starts also from the language. I, I'd also just want to add one thing to it because I think this phrase, I don't want to live like a soldier, um, I, I want to live like a human. And also I wouldn't make uh, this point of this uh, differentiation between society, state, community, civil, I'm all of those things. It's not me and them or me and the other. And I think that the minute you start to reduce down to these kind of like hard lines uh, of society or state or community and civilian, you end up reducing is the point. And the minute you do the reduction, then you are devoid of responsibility and you're kind of going, oh, it's them that takes care of me. So I don't want to be a soldier. I also, don't, I also want to be human within this system and look more at the interrelationships that are reciprocal within this whole system as well. And I think that uh, it's, it's, a, it's an important thing to say on that level. I'm kind of quite conscious that it's kind of closing time and I know that uh, there's always these... Can I have oh. one short question? Cool. <laughs> um, I don't know if you would consider Edward Snowden or Jake Applebaum um, a soldier, I don't know exactly. Um, if you followed the discussion at the CCC conference uh, in December, there was uh, quite a few revelations that uh, on the, let's say, for a moment reduce it to, on, to the hardware level we are working with computers, that these, this hardware we are working with is not trustable. So the, what the revelations of uh, um, Edward Snowden, one of them, one of the documents, was clearly showing that uh, there, there are certain chipsets which are, which are completely um, uh, leaving back doors to the NSA. And um, so translating what you said now, I mean, I would be interested in when I basically would basically start a project with an NGO and I want to have a hardware which is not, you know, I have a choice which hardware I should buy, you know, which hardware I can buy which is not, um, you know, which is trustable enough so it's safe for activists, for example, to not be surveyed. Um, do you have recommendations? Do you know where to ask uh, these to, to find uh, answers? No, I actually, I think, um, again, my colleagues in um, Visa 7, Julian Oliver and uh, Daniel Vasily, uh, could um, have a good conversation, shall we say, with you about that matter. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, and uh, we can kind of uh, follow, follow up because there, there is things that people are developing to, to avoid these, uh, yeah, this very point as well. And thank you for bringing Still, it. Still, I bring forward my point. There is no, there is, the only sure thing in life is death. Yeah. Mm. No okay. way out. Wow. Just a, a short no comment purity. on this. Uh, we, um, some years, uh, well, some people are working on a label called open source hardware. I mean, there's different ones. And, and I think, as we said before, it's if, if, you, if you have the ability to re-engineer it, if you have the ability to look at it, that's transparency. That's the only chance, really, to find out. And uh, there's nothing more to say, really. Mm. <laughs> and 
And about, about Jake and, and uh, Edward Snowden, I know personally Jake, not, uh, not uh, Snowden, I think that they should, uh, we should save them from the rhetoric of militaries. They should not be, uh, their case should not be discussed in a military court. It's not Agreed. a military matter. And that is the only thing I, I have to say about that. Um, I'm going to just wrap up with some phrases um, which uh, I think kind of ring, ring again in the end that we don't want to be soldiers. I think this is quite nice and I also wanted to just uh, take what Emer said in, in terms of there is people who care that actually also work on all the different levels that we have been speaking about within the system and it is uh, often um, in my experience also just going back to, to your question about working with cities and working with governance and people working in governance that uh, it is about um, trying to align with people who care. But at the same time, of course, everything is open in, in what uh, Jaramel said, I think, at the start. This, this, this nothing is pure, and death is the only guarantee. But uh, I think we can... Yeah, yeah, but we can also uh, remain poetic, maybe, in this. And I think this point of... Uh, trying to change some of the discourse and language which is describing the systems and the technical networks that are actually underlining how we frame our mindsets and our attitudes towards this, which I think every one of the, the panel keeps kind of almost... That, that is deeply connected with love. Okay. I'm going to end on this as well. So, love. <laughs> we should have a tune. We should have, we should have had a tune for this. <laughs> okay, thank you all for your participation. Uh, Right. <laughs>